thought commands the muscles, but the muscles shape the thought. Yeah. So it's in that sense that I learned in Aikido how to feel and observe, or maybe observe and then feel, or maybe just yes. Yeah. So it's very simple, it's very common, but most people don't pay attention to it because if you have a certain amount of fluency in reading it, you never think twice about it. But I didn't, so I had to put it together. I often say that I built an intuition in a mechanical, linear way till it jumped off and flew. Hi, I'm Stephanie Dano, and welcome to Unknowingly Connected, a podcast for people open and curious by nature with specific interests in the human potential and the greater good. Twice a month, I interview professionals who have gathered their diverse passions or gifts to be in service of human leadership. You will hear from their journey and their techniques crafted to be within everyone's reach and explained from a scientific, body-mind and spiritual perspective. It's all connected and we might not even know it. Welcome. Today you will hear or see Paul Linden. Paul is an instructor of Feldenkrais Method of Somatic Education. He also holds a BA and in philosophy, a PhD in physical education. He's the developer of Being in Movement, Mind-Body Education. His work has focused on trauma recovery and peacemaking. I invited Paul as he was one of my first teachers in embodiment, and I really appreciated the fact that his work is always testable, scalable, and therefore highly empowering. As you will listen to this episode, you will see we have a beautiful gift to offer you, which encompasses Paul's core exercises, which are simple yet very profound. You will hear about his journey, his focus on word precision, his definition of emotions and trauma, along with few exercises. And for the one who knows Paul Linden, there is a few new ones. So check it out. So good morning, Paul. Good morning, Stephanie. It's great to be here with you. And as everybody can see, I have Parkinson's. I usually start off, I used to start off workshops by saying, I'm here to shake things up. But that's too corny a joke, so I won't tell it today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just to let you know that um, for me, it's a pleasure to, to have you today because um, revisit, it, it enabled me to revisit uh, your teaching. As I think I did uh, a workshop with you three, four years ago. And um, yeah, and it's a pleasure to have you in and to dig a bit deeper around your teaching. Well, I've, in the last two weeks, I've understood something that has eluded me for 50 years. So you're right on time. That's lovely. That, that was meant to be. <laughs> so um, the first thing I would like uh, to see with you is a little bit of your background. Uh, something I haven't been able to see is, uh, where were you born? Because I know you're in Columbus, Ohio right now, but are you from, from there? I was born in New York City. They tell me, I wasn't there at the time, of course, but they tell me I was born in New York City. I grew up in New York, in, in New York until I was seven. Mm -hmm. My father was a symphony violin player. He got killed in a railway accident. So I went to Montreal to live with my grandparents for five years. Mm -hmm. And I came back to New York. Then I went out to Oregon for high school, for college and Berkeley for graduate school. And then I, I got kicked out of graduate school for teaching rats Aikido. Oh, okay. okay. And just worked too. Then after about 10 years of Aikido practice, I went back, got my master's degree at San Jose State. Then I came to Columbus for my PhD and I stayed here. Okay. So we, we will go back to, to that. So you first did a BA in philosophy. Am I right? Yes. Yes. And I'm still a philosopher, but I do it in the body. Yeah, absolutely. But first of all, what, 
what made you choose philosophy? Because I was nuts. You don't you wonder if the Torah really exists. It's a little strange. There was a song that somebody at my college wrote called Epistemology Forever. And it's about the last verse says, For we do not exist. <laughs> I, I don't know what drew me to philosophy. Something made me want to figure things out. Okay. And then I, in, in graduate school, the person who I took a, a, I took a course with a man named Robert Frazier, who had just come back from Japan. He was an Aikido instructor. Hmm. And last day of the class, of the class on the psychology of meditation, the last day of the class, he showed a film of the man who created Aikido. I took one look and I said, hmm. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what caught me, but something said, come. And I did. So actually, I would like to go back uh, to this moment that I've, I've, I mean, I've heard that you usually say like uh, you found Aikido by chance. Yeah. But I'm a little bit curious, as you said, that you had a body reaction when you saw. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was a body reaction. I just said, yes. Yeah. And I, I, I showed up the next day to the Aikido club. I wasn't going to try it. I just said, I'm going to get on that and practice. I didn't know I was allowed to try it or allowed to stop. I just kept going. Yeah. Okay. Something taught me. Absolutely. Um, then um, the, something that happened is, is you usually say that you use Aikido as a metaphor and you also use the physiology of Aikido. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes. Let me take this off. At a certain point in my medication, so I get hot, then I get cold. That's okay. It's all part of the hobby. Let's try something. Can you think of something in your life? Let's say I came up to you and said, here's a plate full of fresh, fresh rat guts. Took them out of a fresh, rat, dead rat. What would you do as I gave it to you? You're right. Is that a mental or physical reaction? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's physiology. And what I'm doing in Aikido, what I've figured out how to do, which I'm, I'm working on with the Parkinson's, I can settle it. I don't quite have the bandwidth yet to settle it while I'm talking. But I've learned through the years, if you're going to approach an attacker, you have to be calm, friendly, respectful, and, and, and wish well for him, wish good to him. How do you do that? Is that a mental or physical thing? Yes. So I figured out in, in Aikido <clears throat> how to do the physical part of what we consider to be emotions. Hmm. So, so just for people who would listen or watch, uh, because the first time you said yes, you know, in a course, I, it, it took me like a few seconds to understand that right. actually it's both. No, it isn't. It's one. It, okay, it's one. <laughs> You cannot have mind-body integration because if they were two, you couldn't integrate them. Absolutely. But you can, you can behave as though they were two. You can speak about them in two ways. You can pay attention to two things, but they are one. So yeah. after, so is that mental or physical? Mental or physical? Yes. Right here. Here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, another thing I wanted to, uh, to talk about to you about is when you say that you learn from Aikido to kind of pre-sense people's intention when they do something in their body so you can see previously through the noticing the micro movement where yeah. the intention is going. Right. How? Okay. Yes, well, how? Are people hearing this or seeing this? I wasn't. Uh, they would be both. So some people would just but, like, yeah. Stephanie. What did you just do? <laughs> what did I do? And how did you respond? Um, it, 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 I play the game because I know you. <laughs> but but so the thing fun. is, it, I, That's I froze. I froze. Yeah. Is that in your mind or your body? Uh, in, your, in my body first. No. No? Yes. <laughs> Okay, let your tongue hang loose. 
Like your chest hangers. Watch. No. What did you do that time? Not much. Did you change your physiology or your thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the thought commands the muscles, but the muscles shape the thought. Yeah. So in, it's in that sense that I learned in Aikido how to feel and observe, or maybe observe and then feel, or maybe just yes. Yeah. So it's very simple, it's very common, but most people don't pay attention to it because if you have a certain amount of fluency in reading it, you never think twice about it. But I didn't, so I had to put it together. I often say that I built an intuition in a mechanical, linear way till it jumped off and flew. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, but one thing I, I want to, to know if if because there's one thing you you shared with me one day is that um when mm. your son was born you noticed something happened in your brain yes i can't describe it some people think it's offensive the best way i can say it is i felt like a computer at the time we used floppy disks with a floppy disk being loaded i am a daddy i felt wow. my myself shift shift genetic code or something but it became me and it was wonderful yeah and but you you were you were aware that something happened in your oh, brain that it was they they put him in my arms and as soon as I held my baby in my arms all of a sudden I, I was reaching out to protect them from the whole world while reaching in to, to hold them with love hmm. and I didn't plan to do that It was just in me. Yeah, yeah. And is it that sensitivity that you had, you know, during Aikido and then you could notice with your son, is it something you have noticed before doing Aikido that you had certain sensitivity? No, no? I did. As far as I can tell, I had all the finer sensitivity of a stick of licorice or a lump of coal. <laughs> I wasn't aware on that level. I read a lot. I, I, I read French and later German and English and read a lot, but uh, sensitivity, what's that? Yeah. Isn't that something? I didn't, know. I didn't know that I was going to build it. It just step by step, I followed my nose and it took me places. Okay. And um, something that I missed during uh, when I was searching from uh, all your trajectory is what led you to do body work or to what happened well, in between Aikido and body work? Interesting. I moved to Columbus as a teaching associate at the university where I got my PhD. And they assigned me to teach a class on movement and self-awareness. And I said, what's that? And then they said, you'll figure it out or, or something. I had a habit of making up exercises for myself. That, not Aikido exercises, but below the Aikido so I could do the Aikido. Mm. And so I went, I, I came, I had about a thousand three by five cards. Remember what those were pieces of cardboard? Nobody sees them ever again. But I, I took the 20 or so that looked like I could transfer them to the class. I taught it. All of a sudden I said, gee, I've invented something that stands apart from the martial art. That's much quicker, much easier. And that's how I started. Then one day somebody said, yeah, I play the violin. Can you show me what you showed Fred in the class? Not for that, but for the violin. I said, sure. And so I did. Mm -hmm. And people started coming to me. Mm -hmm. I, I, if I were intelligent, I would have planned all this out. But it just happened. Oh. That's, so people came to you and that's when you started to learn about different techniques. So, so that's when Feldenkrais came or... You, no. no, I was black belt in Aikido by, the, by that time. Yeah. I, uh, I had already been doing body work of my own. And to tell the truth, I think Feldenkrais work is brilliant stuff. It helped me a lot. But if I'd never taken it, my body work would be almost the same. If I'd never taken Aikido, I wouldn't be doing Aikido at all. Hmm. Hmm. It's a different tool for a different, different purpose. And I think it's brilliant, but it wasn't my purpose. And I didn't know what my purpose was. 
until I was walking across the parking lot. A woman stopped me and said, who are you? You don't walk like anybody I've ever seen. So I told her, and she said, she was a psychologist. She mostly worked with women who'd been abused. Could my work help? I said, I don't know. She said, I'll send you six, and we'll start a group, and we'll see. Ten minutes into the group, I said, yes, this is what I was supposed to be doing. It's everything came together to help people in a way that I could, without the martial arts, without the bad jokes, without the body work, without any of the stuff that I put together, it wouldn't have worked. But everything came together. Hmm. I've just almost finished. And the fact that I can keep functioning after 18 years means I'm doing something right. But I've almost finished the paper on the way the English language interferes with body awareness. So even my philosophy and language stuff applied to the abuse recovery. In the last five or 10 years, I've started working more with peacemaking. I don't know how much longer I'll be here, but I want to make it peaceful before I leave. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Um, there was something I, I would like to, to start talking about because I know it's a big topic. And when I started coaching, it's not something really clear although you work with them, is our, which is emotions. So can you give your definition of emotions for us? Emotions are actions we do in our body. And I, I had somebody phone me the other day, just been diagnosed with Parkinson's. I said, what do you do in your body when you say the word Parkinson's? She said, she started telling me said, what she was afraid of and she, what she was planning. I said, that's not the answer to the question. What do you do in your body? What do you mean? She didn't know what I meant. So I said, boo. I said, did, did you do anything? She went over the phone, of course. She said, yeah, I, I flinched a little. Let your tongue hang out. Let your belly soften. And now I said, boo again, and nothing happened. So I have to show people where their bodies are. Yeah. And I'm uniquely qualified because most people who do body work or, or, or athletics started because they were talented there. Because I wasn't talented. I figured I had to teach the rest of us. Mm. <laughs> and, and, and it's it's a good good thing for us, <laughs> actually. Okay. Uh, would you be willing to do a game? Yes, of me? course. Okay, so I'm just sharing my screen because um, I would like to share with people. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So I just took a wheel of emotion, you know, basic emotions. Uh, there are quite few <laughs> available, but I thought this one was quite interesting. What are basic emotions? What, are they, what makes them basic? Oh, good question. It's, it's just like usually they, they say they are the basic emotion and then like more complex emotion arise or they have the, the major families of emotions, as I could I say. I don't think that way. Every, if you say red, yeah. visualize red. Now, can you visualize a dirty, rusty red? Does it feel the same in your body? No. Okay. Every adjective, every emotion, every word is its own emotion. I don't think they're basic ones. There are similar groups, but I don't like the word basic. So can, can we stick with emotion then? Yes. <laughs> Find your body. So... Yeah. Yeah. So, so my, my, my idea was um, to see if with your work, we can describe a little bit more what one emotion we're picking up is doing. I mean, what we're doing in your body for a specific emotion. Would that be okay with you? It would be impossible. I have to see the person say, what are you doing in your body right now? And you say this. And is that the same thing? I mean, when I say it. One of my exercises is like take a group of people and say, here's a pebble for everybody, one each. Come up and give it to me lovingly. You'll see 10 people do 10 different movements. They have the same word. Is, is, are they doing the same emotion? Sort of, a little bit. But I don't know what the, the, the component of an emotion is until I see one person do their version. It's a very different way of thinking, isn't it? So could I, could I do the game? Yes, of course. I'll try. <laughs> I'm, not always, I'm not always being so. One day in college, somebody said to me, Paul, you'll disagree with anything, anything anyone ever said. I said, that's not true. 
Nga siya, oh, she won. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll go up. So let's see. Um, anger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you do it, please. Mm, so I need to think about something, but. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure what the game is. So the idea would be that how can you, um, so I, I could say and I could tell what I'm doing with the body, but my idea would be for you to show, because I've seen you do some exercises around. You want me to show what I would do? Yeah, what you would do with anger. With anger or feeling it myself? Uh, what do you would do with someone who has anger, like me right now? I would do something to get you angry. You're stupid looking. If that doesn't work, I'll do something else until I find something that does get you angry. But not very. I don't want you to get really upset. <laughs> we still have a little few times to keep going <laughs> in the conversation. But sure, yes. When you say the word... Just canary, anger. Say the word canary. That's what makes you angry. What do you do in your body and where do you do it? I notice a clinch in my stomach. Okay. Um, yeah. Anything else change in your, in your body when your stomach clenches? Mm. I, there's tension here and I can notice my face is more like mm, narrow can you, vision. Can you talk to that tension? And ask her to go someplace important. If she I can, will, it won't. sorry, if I can talk to that tension, you said. And ask the tension to remind you of something important. It will or it won't. You never know. No. Okay, good. When you say no, what happens in your body? Uh, hmm. Yeah, what just happened in the back of your neck? I'm looking over there to see you on the other screen. Yeah, sure. Uh, Hear the difference in your voice? Yes. So what did, what did we do with the anger so far? Uh, I think it's, it's going away for some reason. Right. I don't know the reason. I don't know where it's going. Or I, don't, I never know anything except how to ask questions and help us go someplace. Yeah. Hmm. If I'm intelligent, I come in with a story. Anger means this, and because of that, and because of this, then it would be my story, not yours. I don't yeah. like that. So how would you do with the, um, because the, there's one exercise that you usually do with someone, someone who say like, I'm angry, we have a lot of anger towards someone, which is the towel. The hitting? Yes. Okay, sure. Do you have a towel handy? I do. <laughs> I thought you might. I'll get one too. Actually, instead of a towel, I will use what this comes from, which is a story. Now, if, you see, if any of the people watching playing a story indoors, don't hit the lights up on the ceiling. It's <laughs> bad karma. <laughs> it's a pick up the towel, put it on your head, two hands. Now drop your elbows, let the towel come forward. Good. Now, where do you get the power from? Your hips or your shoulders? Uh, I would say hips. the shoulders. Point, point to your hips first. Where are your hips? Can you see me? Yeah. Move forward a bit. Walk forward. Uh, forward, forward, like this? No, the way the way you were facing before. Now yeah. walk forward, forward, walk, stop. Now I can see your hips. Point to your hip. No, that's the pelvis. The, the pubic symphysis is the bone right above the genital, and the hip. The hip is where the leg folds. Pick one leg up. Yep. That's it. That's the hip joint. Yep. Okay, so. When I, let's see if I, I have to move my screen down a bit, I think. There we go. Now, when I move, see how I move from the hips. I pick up the arm, I let the hips 
and the back leg in particular drive me forward. And then if I don't take out the land, what do you do? And how does that feel? Good. Let's do one other thing with that. When you think of being angry and hitting somebody, you're full of anger and you hit them. Tell me, try that and tell me what it's like. If I'm full of anger, you say. Yes, full of anger and hit the person or the chair or whatever. There I am. What happens to your balance at the end? I'm totally imbalanced. I'm about to fall. Can you think of somebody that may, or something that makes you feel full of love? When you hit from the hips while filling your body and your mind with love. What happens now? It, I didn't move much and it was effortless. Less effort, was it weaker, the hit? Uh, it didn't seem like for the sound of it. To me, but it did look a lot more balanced. Yeah. Okay, so this is impossible. It's not a really impossible it's treasonous and, and it, uh, it's stupid. How can you possibly hit stronger when you're loving? Why does that happen? Mm. What do you do in your body and your muscles when you're full of anger? We contract. When you, when you drive with the parking brakes on, you can, no. but it's bad for the car. Yeah. So if you're going to hit, you have to fill, fill yourself with love towards the person you're hitting. Then you'll be strong enough to hit them hard, but you'll be loving enough that you won't do it if you don't have to. So that comes out of the martial arts again, out of IQ in particular for me. Power without love is brutality, it's not power. Love without power is weak and ineffective, who needs it? Power and love, I think, are exactly the same thing in the body. So that, how would you, um, I would say, how would you make it tangible on specific situation for a client? So I would say, if someone is full of anger, it would be like, I don't care. <laughs> I still want to, whatever. So they gra I'll grab my arm and hold me strong. Now grab my arm and feel love. And then they're flexible. They can move. I can't take their balance. And they, ha they have access to their power. So the question is, do you want to be angry or strong? You can't be both at once. Okay. I prove that. It's not philosophy. It's not religion. It's physiology. Hmm. You don't like it. Get a new body, but if you're a human being, this is the way it works. Hi. This is just a small break to tell you about the gift I've mentioned at the beginning. We've partnered with Paul Linden to create a video with all his core exercises would summarize 50 years of his work. To get it, simply go to unknowinglyconnected.com, same, same name as the podcast, and click on the button, get your free content. This video is about simple yet profound exercises to work with anger, fear, and numbness to create expansion, power, and love. So don't hesitate. Go to unknowinglyconnected.com, click and get your free content to deepen your work and learn again more about the beautiful, beautiful work of Paul Linden. Yeah, so so correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say that if someone keeps with anger, it can have a physiological effect on maybe being sick or yes, having correct. issues. And the other way around, if you if if you stay with anger, there's a reason. It's not enough just to say don't do it. If I say don't do it and I show them how they still keep being angry. And I wasn't teaching well enough. I need to find out more of what they need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I find out what they really need, 
and show them a better way to achieve it. I've had any number of people who've been abused and they come in angry or addicted to alcohol or whatever. I don't see them as ill. I see them as having survived any way they could. So I don't say stop drinking. I say, well, I'll give you an example. A kid came to me. He was sent by a judge downtown. And his first words to me were, I never feel alive unless I've got somebody down on the floor. I'm kicking him, kicking him in the head. So I said, show me your kick. He showed it me. I said, that's no kick. I can teach you to kick stronger than that. He looked at me like, what the fuck? An adult is not supposed to say that. But I said, okay, let, I'll show you. And then I said, had him start relaxing. He said, I don't want to relax. Can you kick hard if you're not relaxed? Well, no. So you better learn to relax. And down through the months, finally I had him going home meditating on loving kindness. I don't want to be loving or kind. Can you kick hard enough when you're hateful? No. And you better shut up and meditate on loving kindness. <laughs> and he, did. he never asked me whether he'd want to kick anybody afterwards. I just figured that was he was needing that. And until I showed him a better way to fulfill his need, he wouldn't give it up. Yeah, yeah. So that actually that leads me to um, to something I've I've noticed recently because you mentioned trauma, so I, I would go from there. Is is that um, so? I've been studying uh, with Gabor Mate. I don't know if you know. Um, I know who he is? But I yeah. don't know who he is. Okay, so uh, so we work around trauma, and I would share his definition of trauma, and you tell me what what it is yours, if that's okay. So for him, trauma is not what happened to you, but it's what happens inside you as a result of what happened to you. Almost uh, the same. Keep going. Yeah, and let me say that uh, trauma is that scarring that makes you less flexible, more rigid, less feeling, and more defended. No. Trauma is what you do inside of you when you're faced with a situation you can which overpowers you. And it, you, could be, you don't necessarily get rigid. You could, get, you could drink or take drugs. You get limp. Anything you do to, to survive when you cannot have the tools to survive, that's what trauma teaches you you have to do. And you keep doing it because you don't know anything better. So, the, keep going, it, please. No, so, so, so your teaching for what I've seen is to help people to have new tools right to replace them yeah new tools to replace the ones that they didn't have now one of the stupider slogans i shouldn't say this but i will real men don't rape children they rape lions and tigers what do i mean by that i mean it's a stupid slogan real men don't rape anybody they help but the point i'm making is you have real chicken shit to hurt a child or an adult who's weaker than you They pick on people because they are weak. They, they the perpetrators, are weak. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, it goes without saying that you need to strengthen the person who is hurt. I do. The end of the process for me, after I've taken them into their body, after they felt the various stages, then we replay the, the abuse or the trauma, and they win. And there's a, a certain smile that comes up on their face. When I attack them, and they trash me, and they sit up with this glowing smile. It makes it all worthwhile mm. for me. Yeah. But that smile is what I'm after. It's the power to protect yourself. The, the example I usually give is, if somebody came to a therapist because they had been in a water accident and nearly drowned, the, the therapist helps them with the fear of water. Who teaches them to swim? And not just swim, swim with joy and power. Mm -hmm. That is what creates the finish on the, on the trauma. So yeah. in the beginning, we agree. It's what you do inside, not the stuff outside. Mm -hmm. If somebody attacks me on the street, I will probably not be traumatized. They might be. Yeah, yeah. After 50 years of martial art, assuming I can stay still long enough to protect myself. Sure. So, so there's another thing, there's another component when we work is and and i haven't heard you mentioning or maybe because it's implicit is um when we we work on trauma in the situation we take a huge emphasis on the relationship 
So if I call myself a therapist, my work is to create a safe environment to be able to express and, and, <laughs> and um, go to the experience of the trauma. How is it for you? Yeah, I'm not a therapist. I don't think that way. I'm not saying therapy is bad. But it's just a different thought. What I do is I create a safe environment, but the safety gets modified as the person gets stronger. So by the end, the safe environment is I'll try to choke you and you flip me and throw me against the wall and say, you can't do that anymore. So safety doesn't come from the therapist or the client. If it, if it comes from the therapist at the beginning, that's right. But if it comes from the therapist at the end, that's wrong. So would you say that you create safety by scaling your work? I used to think it was all the techniques that I put in a row. My book on trauma is 450 pages or so. Yeah. People finally convinced me that it was me that made it safe. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand what they meant for the longest time. Then I finally did understand. I care about the people. I try to attack them and say, you don't mean it. Of course, I don't mean it. If I meant it, I wouldn't be qualified. But I, I role play. Uh, yes, it's the caring that provides the safety. But the caring is when you grow up, I'll be old and you'll be my kid grown up and you'll protect yourself. Yeah. But for some children, they, for some children, sorry, for many people with trauma, they haven't had it. Well, of course, time. that's why I do it. Yeah. That's a, so it is the relationship. And at the end, it's the relationship. Go fly, young eagle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but there's something I, I would like to share with you as well. It's, it's because it's something I've experienced a few times. And, and actually, when I, when I did um, a workshop with you, which was on bodywork, by the way, um, First of all, can, we share, can you share a little bit what body work is? Because I think many people don't know what it is. And actually, when I apply, when I did the course, I didn't know. I just applied. <laughs> so, Again, remember, I was a philosophy major in college. Body work is a word. It refers to something. Yes. But you're happy. What does it refer to when I say the word? Yes. Sure, I'd be glad to ask, answer the question you should have asked. <laughs> body work. Work with the body. With, with, from the point of view of awareness, empowerment, love and power, structural, anatomical, physiological bodywork. If, if I'm balanced and open physiologically, physically, structurally, but I'm like this emotionally, there's some level where this, it's not co cooperating. So I have to be open and spacious, balanced and loving inside as a feeling, and outside it expresses itself as structural, functional efficiency. So, so anything teaches that way with both the inside and the outside, yeah. I think it is body work for myself. Got it. But so, but body work for the way I experience it, at least I, I remember the, the beginning of this workshop is, um, <laughs> which I would happen. Yeah, I was just laying down and you just touched the tip of my fingers and from the tip of my fingers, you open my diaphragm and then I start to cry. <laughs> I mean, tears came up. I was okay. happy, but tears came up. So, okay. sorry? You want to know how I did that? Uh, oh, now I know. <laughs> but, but I would love you to, yes, to explain a little bit more, if, if it's okay with you. My explanation usually would consist of Notice that was just changed in my voice. When I started to contemplate that level of work, my voice changed. Hmm. There's, there's stuff I'm doing that I don't fully understand yet. Another 20 or 30 years, 40 years, I'll stop tremoring totally, I'm sure. But uh, well, how did I do that? I have, okay, a week ago, I, I just might explain it. Look at my hands. Can mm -hmm. you see my hands? Yes. What do pay attention to? I pay attention to your hand and to yourself, but I would say I would pay attention to your head, to your hands first. My first, yeah. Right. And what direction do you pay attention? Forward toward the hand. Are yes. you paying attention behind you to what's behind you? No. Okay. It's just forward, yeah. 
that is normal. But if I'm in a fight, I remember my second degree black belt test uh, 40 years ago. I had five go- big guys, I'm just five, six, five foot six, little chafing here on the mat with weapons. And I, you, if you put 100% of your attention on the close one, the others kill you. So you have to put 100% on the close one and the other 100% of your attention all over. I hope there are no mathematicians in the audience. <laughs> That's that sense of radiate. Okay, pay attention to my hand. Yes. And pay attention backward as well. Mm-hmm. Are you with yourself now? Not now. Okay, pay attention to yourself. There, you feel you've just gone away from my hand. Yes. Pay attention to my hand, but don't go away from yourself. Go into yourself and out. There you go. How's that feel? Uh... Uh, the first word that comes to me is ex- ex- expensive, but I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Yeah, expensive. Notice that I could see it as soon as you did it. I know. <laughs> it certainly is real. Yeah, it's real. That, it is. Reaching out, if you reach out and forget yourself, you have nothing to record the data on. Hmm. And if you go all the way in and meditation, you have no world out there to record. Yes. If you reach out while staying in yourself. You know what that's called? I think that's <laughs> called empathy. Hmm. So what my whole job for the last 50 years has been to build mechanical tools to break down complex human thingies into small chunks that any idiot can do, including me. So I, I figured out how to build these things. And uh, my, my, I, I was 21 in 1967, the, 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 the height of the hippie era. Yeah. And what I realized very quickly was the hippies had the right ideals, didn't have the right tools. Hmm. So I spent the last 50 years building the tools that they should have had then. Luckily, we've got people like Trump today, so we still need those tools. <laughs> and so yeah, I'm trying to contribute them as well as I can. Yeah. And that, that's something, it actually reminds me two things when we were doing the exercise. The first thing is... Um, after I did a workshop with you, I noticed I needed to center before going to see a client. Yes. Because my natural tendency, and I think it's uh, the tendency of many, for what I've seen of some coaches and people with what they call it empathy, they is open. to lean towards the client so much that you lose balance and you lose energy. And you take in their pain. Yes. That's wonderful. Then there's twice as much pain in the world. <laughs> Okay, imagine somebody attacking you. And I go back to Aikido it's yes. because it's my home. If somebody attacks you, I, ha- I have to sense them. I have to know what they're feeling and doing in their body. But if I go, ah, pump your blood into me, yes. that's no good. So I have to have boundaries. But if my boundaries keep from seeing people, then I, what good am I? Mm. So there's a very specific kind of a boundary, which is explicitly with the other person, but doesn't lose you. Yeah. And I just figured out last week, after all this time, how to break that down into something simple. Mm. Took me 50 years, but what the hell, I've got to have a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I wanted to, to share with you, and, and, and so we could talk about it, is... Again, we keep going with body work, but, but I find it fascinating because it can explain to some people how we do emotion with our body. Is that during your workshop, you ask us an exercise, which was to have someone laying down, eyes closed, and touching just by the touch, trying to sense the emotion they were doing with their body. Right. They were, I, I asked them to do a specific emotion. Yes. I didn't, they chose whatever emotion they wanted, I guess. Mm. Yeah. How is that possible? Yes. Okay. Sometimes I think, remember, well, you probably don't remember, you've probably heard the slogan from the 60s, make love, not war. Yeah. I always make love and war. <laughs> so imagine if you're holding somebody you care for, can you feel what they feel? Mm, sometimes. Makes yeah, right. right the ones, I guess. Mm. But... Uh, it's the same. It's just the human faculty. I figured out how to do it deliberately on purpose and break it down. But what you're doing is, 
I, I guess in the last five, 10, whatever years, they figured out what ne- motor mirror neurons are. Yes. That there are neurons which perceive the other person and do in our body what they do in theirs. And I think they believe, they, whoever they are, the researchers, believe that that's the source of empathy. Well, if a dog can feel what we're feeling, surely we ought to be able to feel it, except that many of us can't even feel our own emotions. Yeah. But it's nothing... It's nothing complicated or mystical. It's just what, we, what it means to be human. Hmm. If I find, I'd love to find 12 kids raised in a world which is peaceful, kind, and loving. I've never seen anybody like that. But I bet they'd be very different. Yeah, true. Mm-mm-mm. And um, so there's, there's two things because time is flying, as I noticed. <laughs> one, one thing I, I wanted to, to ask you is, Um, because your work is a lot about openness, Mm -hmm. openness of the body and and everything. (laughs) But I've noticed, I've experienced, and I've noticed clients that when they start to open up again, Mm -hmm. they they sometimes experience something, we call it, um, sorry, in English, we call it um, backdraft. So basically, they flashbacks. No backdraft. So basically, it's like you know when the fire, when you've got the fire under the door, and then you suddenly mm-hmm. open up it, and everything going up. So it can happen as anxiety usually, um, that I could use anxiety coming or, or um, sadness. I mean, not sadness, but basically willing to start crying and not stopping for quite a few days. Mm-hmm. So did it happen in your work and? If yes or not, or what do you do when it happens? Okay. The first time I ever did anything of this sort, uh, that woman who said, I'll send you six in the tri group, brought somebody to my school for an individual session of relaxation. I put it down on the table. I started drawing her open. And all of a sudden, she zoom, dropped into re-experiencing being raped as a little girl. And my first thought, oh, my God, what do I do? And the second thought was Aikido spoke to me and said, go with the power. So I did. Instead of trying to help her or take her out, I said, go into it, feel what's being done to you, describe it to me. Don't push it away, take it to you. And as soon as she feel, finished understanding what happened, we got on the mat and I said, I'm going to do it to you. You're going to beat the hell out of me scientifically, not by flailing and being upset, by centering and using your power effectively and efficiently. And she did. And she walked out feeling great. Mm. And I said to the psychologist, oh, my God, what was that? But uh, I knew what to do about it. I went on the mat and I did some movement and I cleared myself out. But if you don't know how to keep boundaries, you'll take it in. And if you don't know how to help the client keep boundaries, they will get overwhelmed by stuff they didn't mean to have come out that day. Mm. But if you take them into it, if, if you make a nest for them, a container, and they feel, it doesn't bother him. I guess I can be okay. Hmm. So then they will feel that they can be okay because I am. And I'll, sh- I'll guide them. I'll show them how to construct barriers. Not put up walls, but boundaries. Yes. That's the other reason I tell stupid jokes all the time. If, if somebody does something really well, I don't say do it again. They'll do it again 10 more times and get tired and then give it up. I distract them with stupid jokes so that their brain has a time to, di- to digest. Mm. For example, do you know what the Beatles' first song about a lizard was? No. <laughs> they want to hold your hand. <laughs> That's one of my better jokes. You should hear some of the worse ones. I guess you have. <laughs> I have, but for that, nice. No, so, so actually, yes, you've mentioned something about... Uh, jokes and and how to bring fun into your work and you i didn't know <laughs> now i get the why <laughs> you can't have fun with pain and misery what the hell is the point of having it sure <laughs> <laughs> bad, joke. uh, bad jokes yeah um and there was something else i wanted you to to tell us a little bit is when you saying like we cannot not have emotions in the body mm-hmm. What are you? Yeah. Can you stop sitting down? How do you stop sitting down? Uh, Sitting up, standing, yeah. 
do anything sitting down? Can you simply stop sitting down without doing something else? It'd be like digging a hole in the water. You can't do it. Yeah. And you stop feeling sadness. I, I got a, a, a letter from a woman today. And she said she loved my lecture. and She's trying hard to stop feeling fear. I said, you can't stop feeling fear. You have to start feeling peace. Yeah. You can't try hard. If you're trying, that means you haven't broken it down into small enough chunks that you can do it. Mm. So you're trying to stop doing something and you're not achieving it. So that's why you're trying hard and failing. Don't try hard. Don't try at all. Break it down until it's small enough that you can do it. And it's comfortable and it feels good. Then you'll achieve your purpose as you go step by step. But mm. our language tells us, to, I don't know, but I know a few languages, but English in particular says, all these dumb things that you make me feel, you don't, I make myself feel about that. Um, all kinds of constructions. For example, what's another good one? Oh, yes. If I like blue things, I'll, I'll fill my home with blue pictures, blue glasses, stuff. Have you ever seen blue that was not connected to an object, just blue sitting around anywhere? No. What would it be? Um, okay, what is, a, what is a true statement? A true statement is one that you've tested, you've checked out, there's a cat sitting on the couch. You go in there, there is a cat sitting on the couch, you've tested, that's a true statement. Have you ever seen truth sitting around that wasn't about a statement? It's like blues, there isn't that. <laughs> but people spend their lives being mystically involved in searching for the truth. So the language uses nouns to, to describe processes. Can you release a trauma? No, of course not. A trauma is not an object. The word trauma is a noun. It should point to an object, yeah. but it, it points to a process. Hmm. You don't release a process. You substitute a better process. Hmm. And of course, you can do good work believing in all kinds of strange images. There's going to be a lot of people who do very good work, but it isn't so. that You're not releasing a trauma. You're opening your body, strengthening, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. a lot of times when people get stuck, it's because the language gets in their way. And if you don't know how to take people beyond the backdraft, then they get stuck in something coming up. But if you know how to put it into some perspective and give them a container for it, not a wall, not barrier hardness, but love the pain. And then if I hate my tremors, they get much worse. If I feel kindness, my first exercise is Parkinson's. As soon as I go back to the exercise, I settle. Yeah. So it's, it's, for me, it's all connected. It's all wrapped up. It's all just a simple bunch of concepts that took me 50 years to figure out. <laughs> but actually, I think uh, I've been discussing with a few of my colleagues, and there's one word that comes from you, that doesn't exist, but we use quite a lot. And I use it for my client, which is smallifying. <laughs> yeah. i tell you where that came from. I speak fairly fluent German. In German, there's a word for kleinal, which means to, to get small. But mm. it doesn't have connotations either small and tight or small and loose. It's just to get small. Mm. And that's what I want because you, you can collapse, you can contra contract, but you can do that with attention. And the, all the different systems can either get small or open. Yeah. And I couldn't find a word like that. So I made it up, smaller, right? And then I said, smallify is better. So <laughs> I made it up and uh, it now exists. It, it does exist? Yeah, I made it up. And oh, yeah, it. sure. <laughs> How do you but, think in, 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 uh, in, in English? Oh, it's, um, <laughs> just thinking, but I don't so, know it does. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to traumatize you. <laughs> uh, Paul, I had many things in mind and now I'm doing a bit like okay. here and there. So I'm trying to see. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to see. First of all, is there anything you wanted to share that I haven't mentioned? I was thinking of that. I was trying to figure out what. Yes. I finally figured out that my real question is how can we bear to hurt each other? And what I've realized is, I think, fight, no, fear, anger, and numbness are three basic, basic, I didn't use that word, did I? <laughs> are three basic human responses to being challenged, threatened, or hurt. 
if we're numb, we can't feel, if we don't feel our own pain, we can fight or run and do the best we can at whatever if we're numb. But if we're numb, we also don't feel the other guy's pain. Hmm. So we can hurt people because we're, in a sense, I'm saying prejudice is good. It's stupid, but it's just, anything you don't know that isn't part of your family, kill it. It might want to kill you. So if it's different from you, all right, fear, anger, and numbness. And then we can kill it and not feel it. Yeah. And the, the people we do it to get into fear, anger, and numbness, and they do it to us. Hmm. And round and round it goes because that's what we're built for. We're built to live in small families and hate everybody else. And that way we survive. And what I finally realized is love is not the answer. Love and power in the body are the answer. And I figured out how to teach those quickly and simply. But what I'd like to do, what I'd, what I'd like to do is to get this somehow spread so that people would know these simple basic tools and know to use them and teach them. Hmm. The, there's a handout on my website, which is 12 pages. It's got five or six exercises. It summarizes 50 years of this stuff. The previous attempt at simplification is about 40 pages. It's also free. It's a bunch of free stuff on the website. Go and grab it and spread it. It's not copyright. I, I released the copyright on almost everything. So okay. that's what I would like to say. Hmm. And, I, and I, I would like to share as well that is, there are some tools of the ones you are sharing for free that I've been using um, for my work and I've been using in your shop, in workshop and actually um, when you mentioned power I just wanted to specify and I've been listening to some podcasts you've been doing recently tell me if I'm wrong but power for you mostly mean boundary setting no it's an experience in the body mm -hmm. of, of openness and brightness and then you will have boundaries but you're not setting them. You're just becoming open and bright and kind and mm -hmm. grounded and stable. Let me show you something that I've been doing mm -hmm. for an Aikido. This is very strange. I don't know if I can do it this morning. We'll see. There's hard martial arts and soft martial arts. I'm thinking of an attack and an Aikido that has... That's the same attack and same defense but a hard response to it, not difficult. But, hmm. but notice I, I, I can release it instantly. I'm not stiffening and then staying stiff. Hmm. So I see hard and soft as being essentially the same thing. This power and love is essentially the same thing. Hmm. And so I'm going to, I didn't know I was going to go in this direction. I've got a black belt in karate, but I didn't know this piece would come back 20 years later. Hmm. And something's happening, but... I never know where, where I'm going to after I get there. So I'll tell you when I get there. <laughs> so just let, let, let me uh, know, because you, you mentioned that you're writing something yeah. that you're about to use. What is it about? Well, it's about language. Okay. And it's, um, it's a very strange thing. Everything else I've written is very logical, stepwise and linear about it. You open this and you flow that and you do this with the skeleton. This is about language. And I go from, I start with a concept that um, I just understood, high abstraction and low abstraction language. If I say to you, extend your energy to the end of the universe, do you know what the hell that means? No. If I say, can you imagine being an ember in a fireplace and you feel the heat glowing a centimeter or two centimeters, three centimeters off your skin? Does that change anything yes. in your body? Okay. That is the same thing as extending to the end of the universe, but I didn't say extend your energy. I don't know what the hell that means. I certainly know, don't know where the end of the universe is. Hmm. If I use a high abstraction, poetic image, it might be very lovely, and maybe for the people who understand it, it works, but I prefer to stick with things in the body in normal English that anybody can do. So that was one thing in the paper. And then the other major piece is about nouns. When I was in college, I was walking by the, uh, a pond in the spring and I saw the pollen drifting down onto the surface of the pond. And I said to myself, oh, the winding is blowing the pollening onto the ponding. 
there were no objects. There wasn't a wind and a pond. There was a winding and a pollening and a ponding. I don't know why I said that, but it, it seemed obvious at the time. And that stuck with me. And I, more and more I realized there are no, it's not objects, it's processes. Mm. So that has colored everything I've done since then. I didn't know it was going to, but. Hmm. Is, it, is it something, because, because I asked you the other day, uh, that you would call it, I know you wouldn't call it that way, but that people understand it as energy flowing? Mm. I don't know. Um, when you, if you, let me try something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happened? Did anything happen in your body? There. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Let me try something. Back here, behind you, in your neck. Mm -hmm. How did I do that? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I do know what I did. Is that what it, people mean by energy? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, It's what I've listened to, but uh, yeah. It's a sense for me, I, I use the word intention. Yes. You have to demonstrate, I intend to go get that. I can, here, let's try something. Raise your arm up to shoulder height. Put it down. Now raise it up halfway. Put it down again. Keep doing that over and over again, halfway each time until mm. it gets so small that I can't see anything on the outside. Can you still feel something on the inside? Yes. Okay. Keep your arm down by your side. Mm -hmm. Raise that stuff on the inside, whatever it is, up to shoulder height. There. Not the arm, the stuff. Oh, the stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can you feel that? Yes. Now put it down and raise the arm and the stuff at the same exact time up. Both move up. Move your arm and the stuff. <laughs> I mean, literally raise your arm, but do it at the same time as you move the stuff. Are you? <laughs> I'm trying to. <laughs> Try. Raise the stuff and then have your arm catch up to it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it up, do it. Yeah, feel. Does that feel different than just raising the arm? Yes. In what way? I know where I'm going. Yes. And you can go there more easily. Most people feel it's a little lighter and smoother to move. Yeah. That feeling of the stuff, whatever it is, is what I call intention. Mm. Is that the same thing people mean by energy? I don't know. You have to ask the people. <laughs> well, that, that's what some, uh, it's, it's really hard to say, but uh, I would share with you something that would be maybe easier. The, the one of my teacher would say, for instance, that that's, how we can sense people, even like through Zoom that we're doing right now. You can exactly pinpoint what you're doing, but other people can sense what's going on. They can't really explain, so they would call it energy. Okay. Well, is it an explanation when I say what I'm doing? <laughs> It's like, I know what electricity is. You flick a switch and it does things. Mm. I don't know what electricity really is. The physics, yeah. maybe someday, We'll know what that stuff is. Mm. In the meantime, I remember back at the time that they kicked me out of graduate school, I had to decide, do I want to be a researcher? Do I want to go out and actually learn how to do this stuff? Mm. And decide to drop out and study Aikido for full time for 10 years. Yeah. So I, I am content almost to be able to do it and help people with it. I would like to know what it is, but not enough to spend my life doing that. I'd rather play with people. <laughs> that's lovely well thank you very much Paul it has been really a pleasure to be with you Stephanie I feel the same it's been so it's been a very nice interview I feel welcomed by you it's very nice thank you so much ah, thank you you're welcome there's, there's something I always um, like to do is yeah. and, and I think uh, because you I, I know you you like your love for learning uh, it's Uh, something I'm going, just going to share my screen because I wish this person could speak to you, but you didn't have time, unfortunately. So here it is. I'm going to share it right now. Is 
this person, which I know, and because we've been talking about energy and the importance of words. This person is called uh, Willem Lammers. Hmm, it looks very much. Okay. <laughs> and his practice is something called logosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you heard about uh, logotherapy from Viktor Frankl. Yes, that I know. Yes. So what he's doing is um, helping people with the power of words, mm -hmm. which is really focusing on. And it makes something that you may would be curious to learn about, which mm -hmm. is his strength with the power of words to um, let the energy flow. And he would call like some belief or... Um, what happened in people is that they have the energy frozen. So mm -hmm. they would use the words for that. Yeah. So that would be just something, a little thing, if you feel curious or Yeah, it would anything. be. And if he's interested, it'd be fun to talk with the three of us even. Absolutely. So, so because it, it's someone I'm no, I, I know, but he was really busy right now. So I would be really looking forward yeah. for you to, to connect for some reason and see what you share in common. That would be, that's what Zoom is for. Anytime you can wake me up in the middle of the night. <laughs> I may not be too intelligent in the middle of the night, but I'd love to talk with you both anytime. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation with Paul Linton today. As said previously, apart from the freebie we've offered uh, that you can find on the website of unknowinglyconnected.com you can find Paul on his website beinginmovement.com where you can also see some of his book and other videos and contact him looking forward to seeing you on the next episode of Unknowingly Connected and remember it's all connected and we might not even know it See you soon.